So first, uh, let's answer some really simple questions from this structure, okay? Um, so why is this a resonant figure? So before the resin edge, what did you have for this one? I mean, rising edge means it rises from something, right? So what is that? Come on. Zero. <laughs> and if I just draw a table, so we're going to look at three signals, one here, one here, one here. So which one is R, which one is S? For these two. As R. So we have three signals. Plug R as. And now let's find out. So you have three signals. If you want to just explore all the combinations, how many do you have? Eight. Starting from next one zero one 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 zero one 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 and that's all the possibilities, right? And now let's look at um, when clock is zero. What's going to happen? Is that possible you have like something other than one one for R and S? If clock is zero, if you got a zero here, what that zero is gonna do to these two nine gates? It's gonna kill these two nine gates, right? And give you what? One one. So never have when clock is zero, you'll never have these states. Impossible. But this is possible, right? So that's right before the rising edge. Just make clear on that. So when clock is one, it's a logic high. And if you have R and S to be both zeros, is that possible? Let's see, zero, zero. This zero is being shorted to this pin. So what's gonna happen to this one? Yeah, it's going to force this pin to be 1. So 0, 0 is not going to happen. Right? Now, what about 1, 1, 1? Why? Let's see. 1, 1, 1. I got a 1 here. 1 here. Then what? One here, one here, data here, what's this? One here and data here, what's it, what is this? Data bar? So what is this? Data bar? So what is this? It's not zero right now, right? It's a previous one. We don't know because we don't know what it is, right? But here is one now. So it's being inverted, you got data. And data bar here, data bar here, one here, one here. So what is this? Data, why? We're not, we're ignoring this pin since we're not setting it. It's being operating in a normal, uh, normal mode, right? So data here. So what is here? Yeah. So what is this? Data bar. So they are inverted. So they won't be one ones. So which means this is impossible. I only have two states left. Simple and easy. So that's clock, when clock is one, R and S must be different. As a conclusion here, right? You're still asking like, why they are different? Just watch the video, right? <laughs> okay? They are different. 
And if we assume, let's look uh, look at the, the uh, each case each time. Um, so it's going to be the holding state. So what about the rising edge state though? Let's starting from for example, um, it starts with zero because the rising edge starts with zero, right? Okay. So when it's zero, what are these two pins? Ones. So at the rising edge, so what's the, what's the magic for the rising edge? Yeah, it's a very short period of, a period of time for a logic high. Uh, but it's an actual logic high. You want to treat it as a high. So in that case, um, whenever this is changing from 0 to 1, um, these ones will, are going to change. But before we do that, let's look at these uh, data lines. So we have 1 here. Whenever it is still at 0, it's going to be 1, 1, 1 here as well. Data here, one here, one here. I mean, one is still zero. One clock is still zero before the rising edge, okay? So one here, data here, and ignoring reset. So data one being none, you are getting data bar. So data bar here, all right? And because this is zero, it's being changed. So the clock, this line, is being changed from zero to one. So whenever this is zero, it's gonna cue this non gay and give you give you a one for s. But now, at the rising edge, what's happening is this is being changed from zero to one. So this is being changed from one to what? Data. Now look at this one. What's happening for this one? So you had data bar here. And because this is one, so this is data. And here it's going to be data as well. And this used to be zero because it's right before the rising edge. So it's going to be changed from zero to what? At the rising edge. One. Whenever, so when you got a data here, is the data bar. No, it's not because zero is going to kill the non you got a one at the zero, when the, when the clock is zero. But now it's changing from zero to one, and this one will be changed from one to what? Data bar. That's what's gonna happen. So now we know that it's a rising edge trigger. Why? Because data is being sent to Q. Is that correct? You say, hey, this is data bar, it's not data. But what is being sent to kill? What is being sent to kill? S. Is this data? Yes. So at the rising edge, it's going to send this one to here. You say, hey, this is data bar, but it's being inverted. Look at the little bubble here. So it's still data. So we know at the rising edge, it's gonna send data to kill, no problem. So what about afterwards? Is this going to hold that data? So that's the next question, right? So let's assume that data is one. If data is one, we have one here. At the rising edge, it was one, right? It sampled the data and then got one to kill. So we got one here, one here, zero here. For example, data changes right after the rising edge. So when the clock is high, it changes for any reason, like noise or something, right? So this changed to zero. So we want to see if it's going to loop, going to affect Q. So we can prove this is only rising edge trigger, but not level trigger. We want to hold it. We want to hold it like a memory after the rising edge, right? So now let's see. If this one changes to zero after the rising edge, it's going to kill this guy, 
I give you one here and one here. Zero here. And if here's zero, uh, it's going to kill this one. You're getting a one here. And X data changed from uh, one to zero, but it was still zero here. So you're getting a one. It used to be one, and now it's still one. It was one here, and now it's still one. So it's not affecting. So it's raising a trigger, and at a logic high, it's going to hold the value there, not changing. You can also prove it by flipping RNS. You can give a different example, like 1001s. Zero, zero it's going to all work for these uh, different situations. And so let's look at one of the simulations we have. Prove it. So first one, I want to let you guys look at the very simple version of the SR35 sample. Here, so the first one to show you is B flip flop master slave. This one. <clears throat> so first question, what is this flip flop? What is it? No. It's a D flip flop and it's a master slave flip flop. Is that rising edge or falling edge? Trigger. Falling. Why? It's being inverted. Right? So let's run it. So I want to probe the clock, the data, Q, and Q bar. So I need a four plot pins. So data first, clock second, Q and Q bar. So you can find out Q, Q and Q bar being inverted nicely. Good sign, so it's working. So that's the data, that's the clock. Change the scale so you can see the higher voltages. Because this is a falling edge trigger. So the changes only happens, only happen at a falling edge. And now let's see if that's true. Here is a change. It's at the falling edge. Right? You're saying, hey, here's a falling edge. It's not changing. Why? The sample at the rising edge is not changing. Right? You sampled here first. It's a logic high. You sample again. It's still high. So it's not changing. And now, Sample is a zero, change zero, right? Sample, hold it, it's a zero, it's just sampled, change it, boom, one. Why? Why is one? If sampled to zero, it should be a zero. One, one. Sample to one, send a one. Sample to zero, send a zero. Sample to zero, oh. Interesting. I don't know, I will look into that later. Sample to one, send the one. Sample to one, send the one. Sample to zero, send the zero. So all the other ones works perfectly. Sample to one, send the one. Yeah, I don't know what's going on for this one. Sampled. Yeah, let's find out next time. 
but the sun, the data here is uh, zero. Oh yeah, it is, it is. Yeah, so because there's a little overlap. So there's a little overlap here, that's right, yeah. See? So the data actually get into it. <laughs> You know, why, why this shouldn't happen? I mean, this is not correct. Why this happens? This should happen in the digital system, right? So why it happens? Because we have a super slow clock. If you have a super sharp clock, this won't happen that significantly. You won't because all the clocks are ne super narrow, right? Yeah, you won't see that. Or there might be some, still have some uh, effects like that, but won't be significant since they are super narrow and very close to each other. Thanks, Dr. Crawford. Yeah. So let's look at the other one. Um, DFF level trigger. And they can build a simple, uh, symbol from the level trigger one, like this one, right? And it's a level trigger. So if I run it, uh, clock as well. D clock. So whenever at logic high, whenever the uh, data changes, the output changes as well at the same time. So if you look at here, Q duplicates D during this time frame. See. So during logic high for the clock, Q tracks VD. Is that right? Did you get that? So this is the level trigger. This is the last ideal. And let's look at another one. So the GF5 clear one. This one. So I added two signals here. One is pre uh, preset, and another one is clear or pre reset. So as we uh, discussed before, this is not the ideal one because you cannot set and reset Q and Q not at the same time. Because when you are killing this NAND gate, this is not being affected. We want this Q not is always an inverted value for Q. So we don't want to use this one, even though it's everywhere on the textbook, right? So the one we want to use is the TI version, uh, DFF MS, this one. <clears throat> so that's the one I just showed you on the paper. And that's data. Wait, it's gonna take a long time to simulate, so I probably won't run it. Yeah, we don't have too many gates. It's, it takes time. Hmm. All right, let's stop it. So you, you will have time to run it uh, for your homework, right? I should show that. Yeah, so that's the data. And what we want to look at, clock. So see here, I put a VDD here for, for, for stat not, right? So what's going to happen? 
So it's a negative active, uh, negatively active, right? So if I have a one, then it's not going to kill anything. So that's actually active mode. It's not setting anything. For reset, I put a VDD here as well, here as well. So I'm not resetting the circuit as well. So it should operate. And that's D. Here's clock. <laughs> it's a better clock. <laughs> and Q. Q not. We need four plot pings. Now let's see. First, Q and Q not are inverted. Great. Okay. A good sign. And next, let's see if this guy is falling, uh, falling edge or rising edge. Rising edge. So let's see. Uh, 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 uh. Sample not changing. It's still zero. Sample change, right? It changes. Sample not changing, but it's still one. One is being sampled, right? See here? This rising edge still sampled at once, so it's not changing at the falling edge. Am I correct? It's called a synchronous D flip flop. Whenever it samples, it directly sends that data to the to the queue. It's not like the asynchronous flip flop we just mentioned. So the master slave one is an asynchronous flip flop. It samples and then send. If it samples at the rising edge, then send it at the falling edge. But this guy's different. So directly send it whenever it samples. There might be a little bit delay, but it's gonna send it. That's why falling edge is not triggering anything, right? So, when I was talking about this guy, I was wrong. But now, you can find out the changes is being triggered at this point. It already start rising because of this rising edge. Any questions? When we are looking at the schematic of the TI D3 fob just now on the paper for all these, these print, printed papers, right? So whenever we talk about the data at the rising edge, it's going to trigger the change at the queue. We are not waiting for another cycle, did we? We didn't. So we're going to send it to queue. So that's why it's verified. Whenever it has a different value, it's going to send to queue and invert it to queue bar. Right? It's a really nice design. It's a commercial product. That's why it's going to work. <laughs> They're not going to expect this to fail, right? It's, you can buy it on the market. And um, so we are going to use it for our ADC as well. Uh, it works perfectly. So let me see if there's another one I want to show you. Okay, so let's look at the overall architecture of the Star DC, so I can uh, bring out the idea of the sample and hole circuit. <clears throat> so we had a, for example, there's an analog signal comes in, and first you're using the sample and hole, and the comparator is critical. I have a really, I just saw, I watched a very good video. Uh, it's from a conference. Uh, one professor just presented this history of Star DC in 12 minutes. It has all the most important references being included in the slides. So I send it to the senior SAM team, but I will share it with everyone after this. It's very important. Just watch all the, uh, watch the video and uh, check down to the every single reference and, and read, read them. It's a very, very good one. So you understand that after you watch the video, you understand that the uh, comparator is a super important component in the circuit because you need a super high open loop gain to trigger the change 
whenever the voltage change here is tiny. So you can achieve a better resolution. And a comparator uh, is gonna send the data to a timing, uh, timing circuit or control logic. And then send it to the SAR block. For example, it's a four bit version and you need a DAC. And that's B3, B2, B1, B0. And the DAC has a VREF, of course. And it's feeding back the signal back to the comparator to give you that comparator's output. So I've done that many times, so you know how the SAR algorithm operates. So, um, we have several answers, I uh, have several questions not answered yet. So first, what is this guy? Sample hole, yes. And second, this is the output of the SARDC, is that correct? But the thing is, it has how many states during one cycle, uh, during one conversion? How many cycles? Five cycles for this four bit version, right? So for all the five cycles are going to have a lot of intermediate values and you don't want. So as an output, it's gonna output all these states, but you only need the, the very final one, the last one, right? What's the solution to solve that problem? Wait, right? Wait, wait until you got the last one. How do you wait until the last one? But who is gonna send the command? You want it to operate by itself. You don't wanna have another person, you pay him $50,000 a year to just trigger that ADC, right? <laughs> you need it to be autonomous, right? To do it by itself. How? So for a four bit version, we need a five states. So after the fifth states, it's done. The conversion is done. And we have the final result value here ready for the, uh, to, for the customer to sample it. So you need a, a something to trigger that, that, uh, that door. So we call it a door clock. And you want to connect these signals to four different flops. like a door latch only pass these digital signals to the final output whenever it receives a command right here's a clock with the door clock so this is being shorted to the clocks here 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 and here so that's the final result not these ones so here's another question. How do you design that clock? So for every conversion, you need to count four, five times. Like boom, 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 boom. Send, then reset, then do it again. Boom, 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 send. So what is that? in circuit, you wanna implement it in circuits, right? So what is that saying? Is that a counter? So you have original clock to do the SARS, right? Here's a clock for SAR. It's always doing it, right? Yeah, as one to wait and then count until five, then send it. So that signal, for example, you have original clock. I'm gonna put it on another paper. So original clock here.
okay? And the clock for the door. Rising edge, rising edge, three, four, five. Do we want to send it at the fifth one or the sixth one? The sixth one. Since the fifth one will make the data ready and the sixth one will send it out. If you do it here, then you're not sure, right? If the data is ready. So the sixth one, you want to send it out. So it's a counter, right? So for that clock, for these guys, for these different clocks, you don't want to send it. Whenever it's trying to sample the data during these clock cycles, you want to keep that clock low. Trigger it. And how long do you want to keep it? I mean, I'm going to follow that rising edge with a logic high. So how long do you want to keep it high? Long or short? And why? Yeah, so sample, you're ready. You don't spend too much time, it's not making sense. The rising edge triggered, it's not level triggered. So after the rising edge, it's done. And you don't wait too much time because you want to have a higher sampling rate. You want to save time if you can, anywhere. And then, you know, why has to be here? Rising edge trigger, so can, can trigger that change. And then wait another five, uh, six rising edges and then trigger it again, right? So send it out. Send it outside of the door every five cycles. This is how you time it. And now, yeah, so we're using this one everywhere. So that's the only D3 power we're going to use. It's just everywhere. That's the, that's the only one we're going to use. Rising and trigger and the set and reset, right? So, <clears throat> how can we implement this guy, implement this logic in circuits? It's a counter, right? We need a counter. So the counter is like this. Um, D, Q, Q bar, still the same flip flop. Why we want to use the same flip flop everywhere? Why not? You design a block, it takes time, and you do the schematic, and convert it to layout, you run DRC, run LVS, it's all matches, and you had a beer to celebrate it, and then you want to design a new flip flop. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it's going to work. Just reuse it. You have that block, you want to reuse it. Even though when you are using not hand-drawn uh, IC chips, if you are doing in a barrel log, uh, you are writing a code, just use the computer to write the code, and it's coded up, it's RTL level, and you synthesize the code into schematics or layouts. You still want to use the standard, standard cells. Uh, if we are using the TSMC 180 nanometer technology, they have standard cell library, so which means they have all the non gaze un -gaze, and flip-flops available in the library. That's why we paid 5,000 bucks to them. And they have these standard cells. You write a viral code, you say, I want an unlogic. And it's going to synthesize the unlogic. And just bring that cell, can be a layout, can be a symbol, from the library and make the connections. So for the tools, the EDA tools, they do not care about what's inside. You tell them what's inside. They only do a register or a register level. So they only recognize all the ports. So you have an NGA, it's going to be A and B to F. So it's just grab a part, whatever you put, can put everything inside. But if you tell them it's an NGA, it's going to be, a, they'll treat it as an NGA, right? And they just use the ports and make the connections and route it. If you have done the PCB design, we can single click on the Eagle PCB and run a auto routing, right? But now, it's the same principle. You just uh, click auto routing, it's gonna route even the layouts. Is that amazing? Even the layouts, it's gonna route it for, for you. The reason we have to do that is because the modern CPUs have 
how many transistors, like billions of transistors, it cannot, it can never time draw in every single trace. So our ALU, uh, the final project, the project for the lab in this class, it is, it's not too big, right? It takes like, takes people two weeks to, to, to draw it. Um, but it's not even a CPU, it's a, it's a ALU. So these are standard cells. We, we are not uh, doing viral log synthesis, synthesis uh, just all manually drawn uh, layouts. Uh, but eventually, you know, that's the ALU, and it's only 8-bit ALU. It takes people two weeks. If you read the lab reports from, others, from the students from last semester, you know, the discussion section, you know, everyone is saying it's, <laughs> It's very boring to draw every single transistor and put them together. Um, yeah, but I think it's good to experience it, right? At the first, uh, it's the first layout anyway. So it's good to know how to do it. Um, okay, let's move to the next one. Counter, right? The counter, the counter schematic looks like this. And why is this a counter? So you have a clock. Rising edge trigger. Still the same, still the same default. We're not changing, still the same. Always. Always. Standard style. Library. So if Q is one, Q bar is zero, so zero will be fed back to here, it's gonna flip it at the next cycle. Why? Because D is being sent to Q. Make sense? Right? And it's gonna flip Q bar and then flip Q again next time. Only happens at the rising edge. If I draw the Q, For example, I got one zero. So one. At the rising edge. Right? Samples Q bar and become zero. And then wait until where? Until one. So what's happening? One zero 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 one 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 zero. Oh no, uh, sorry. Uh, one zero 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 one one zero one one zero. Um. No, we're not looking at the clock, right? We're looking at the ones, uh, one zeros. So for Q, it's just flipping. It's just flipping this Q every time. If you got another one, so for this Q, we want to use this Q to trigger the clock for the next one. And D here, Q bar, Q. And if we have, we, we, if we name this one as Q1, this as Q0, so we got a two-bit counter, and that's Q1, that's Q0, okay? And if Q1 is like this, and since we know the original clock, the frequency of the original clock is being divided by what? If you look at Q. Yeah. What about Q0 though? A quarter of the original frequency. So it's gonna look like, um, 
So only happens at the rising edge will trigger the change, right? If you have this, do this, do this, and get another one, another one, rising edge triggers the change, and do it again here like that. So starting from here, if you only look at these uh, rising edges, and you start with zero, zero, and here you got zero, um, yeah, we have to start from here because this is not the original state. This is one, one, and here's zero, one. And here is uh, one, zero. And this is uh, zero, zero. This is one, one. Is this counting? It is? No. Um, it's counting down, but it looks like it's not. One, one, the next one should be zero, zero. What is So this is a, a, a half of the original frequencies, uh, and this is a quarter of the frequency. So I didn't draw this nicely. That's why I couldn't see it. Now let's do it again here, for example. Okay. So only at the rising edge is going to trigger the change. For example, this is Q1. Q0 is here. Change. 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 Zero, one, one. Zero. Still not going through that. Let's run the simulation and see what's happening on the on the tools. Uh, Here. Here. Let's run and see. That's the original clock. And that's Q. And it's been divided into halves. Look at it. Oh, it's one more logic, so it should be two or something. So I have a reset at the very beginning, so that's why it's showing zeros. If you look at reset signal, I can probe it. So it being reset until here, okay? And the, the, the rising edge right after that triggers the change. So that's why the Q is only a half of the frequency of the original clock, okay? So this works, this little counter works, and then I got a 10-bit version The reason we need an inverter is because it's originally just counting down. Um, and when you are looking at these four bits, can you just directly tell me if the clock is from the left, the original clock is from the left? And what is one is MSB and what is one, so which one is MSB, which one is LSB for the counter and why? 
in a simple way. So uh, this one is being triggered every time, which means it's going to be LSB. It's counting by one each time. So this will be the MSB. So if I run it, this will take longer time even. So if you know you have a counter like this, and it's a four-bit counter, what's the maximum number you can count to? No, four-bit. 15. Is that 15? So 1111 is 15. And if it's a four-bit uh, four ADC, so you want uh, you you just need a so in the five cycles to finish the conversion, and the six cycle to trigger the change to send the, the data outside of the door, right? So you just need a six. You just need to count count to six. We actually don't need four bits. We only need three bits to get it done because three bits will give us eight. One one will be seven, right? So it's still enough. But now just let's just look at this one. If I have five. And we have four, four uh, different blocks. I want to count it until six. What kind of logic you still need to be added to this counter? So these are those queues, right? They are being inverted already. So queues are being sent to these. So queue bars are being sent to these. Okay. So oh, queue bar being sent to these. 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 And these are also being sent to the next stage as clocks. Anyway, let's just disregard all the uh, internal structure of the of the counter. So right now we have a counter, for example, right? And it's going to count until. But we want uh, this one only count to for the four bit version. Four bit ADC. You need the five cycles, and you need the, the six cycle to stand it out. So we need a, this one to count to six. So what is six? Before you know what is six, you need to know what is MSP, what is LSP. So where is MSP, where, where is LSP? We just did it, right? So you are looking from the right hand side. And you need a six to trigger something. So six means zero, one, one, zero, right? And then do what? Is that making sense? So this circuit will make 0, 1, 1, 0, the only combination can give you a boom, rising edge, or 1. Why is unique? Think about it. If it's not 0, 1, 1, 0, it's something else. It's going to happen. If this guy is 1, what's going to happen? You got 0, kill the gate. 0, 0. Any other combinations will make a zero. Only zero one one zero can give you a one, which means whenever this guy counts to zero one one zero, 
is going to trigger the change as the output and you can use that signal to do whatever you want you got a signal you do whatever you want you can reset the counter how do you reset the counter you know it connect to the reset what does reset mean here clear it counting from zero again and two six and then reset and you can also do something else a lot of other things in the star idc but you do need that signal all right um so we are going to run more simulations next monday and you are going to expect the quiz on Monday as well for the is there a quiz oh a quiz for the uh flip-flops timing diagram flip-flops if i give you a clock give you a, a d and i tell you it's a master slave JK flip-flop or D flip-flop, can you draw the output for the queue? You're just looking at the rising edge, right? When the rising edge is what happens, the job. Otherwise, in the track. Anyway, I'll give you some examples at the beginning of the lecture on Monday. <laughs> All right, see you next time.